Hello, everybody. Oh, a lot of people again. Very nice to be here again. People from all over the world uh, to see our live talk with Professor Tastan. People from Turkey, a lot of people from Latin America, Mexico. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, Valerio, also, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Wow, that's so great. Great, Valerio, thank you. Thank you. Very honored to have you here. Thank you. Rodolfo, oh, great. Yes, yes. We just started and almost 300 people today is a very special day because um we uh, we started advertising this live talk and we had almost a thousand people subscribing for this so it's amazing to see um how people are really focused on this difficult time of pandemia everybody trying to learn a little bit more and today we have a pleasure to have dr tashton here uh, I'll tell you a brief story uh, that I had with Professor Tashton. I was this year in maybe one of the last rhinoplasty meetings in the world, uh, which was in Nice. And I was learning, I was with Valerio, uh, Baris, and everybody there, and also Tashton was there. But on that time, I didn't know him. I just knew about, uh, about him through articles and through his technique of rib harvest and after that there i went to turkey and on the airplane i just seated right beside him it was amazing because i had a wonderful trip to istanbul uh and right beside him and he started explaining to me all his philosophies and his techniques and it was really amazing amazing because uh for me when i sat right beside him uh, I just saw a very experienced surgeon with some little papers making notes. I thought, oh my God, this is, uh, he looked like a resident. He was really motivated like a resident taking notes and also drawing he, what he was thinking about rhinoplasty. And I, I, I thought, oh my God, this guy is really excited about rhinoplasty. And when I realized that it was Dr. Tashton and he started talking to me and explaining all these things to me, I was amazed how uh, a guy like him, so experienced surgeon, uh, still with his mind open to new uh, thoughts, to new techniques, and that was really impressive for me. So I'm gonna invite him now for our live talk, and let's uh, share with you guys a little bit of uh the amazing experience i had right beside him in this airplane trip okay let, let's invite him hi, hi. Ashton, how are you hi, hi. Uh, uh, thank you uh, i have a little bit make you tired about the connection uh, uh, thank you everything and also uh, i want to thank all the colleagues listening uh, us now uh, as you mentioned we are now in a really uh, a little bit uh, difficult times, of course, about the pandemic. And uh, maybe tonight we will have time to discuss a little bit, let's say, joyful things, let's say. This is, this is a joy for, for us, I think. Yes. Um, and, um, and also I want to thank you, of course, for, for your invitation. And uh, as you mentioned, I, I think Valeria is there also. Uh, uh, I hope he is also uh, okay in Italy. So uh, today, if you want, we can start to the uh, talk or first some questions. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's talk a little bit, and then you can start with your your with your lectures and cases, right? Uh, ah, yes. just, to, just to show a little bit here, very briefly, because I don't want waste time with that, but just to make a little, uh, uh, just to show people a little bit about the experience we had, uh, just about what I, I just said. Ah, yes. Can uh, we see? Uh, 
so this this was us together in in the airplane and i really had a private lecture with dr tashton on that day he explaining uh the philosophy that uh why cutting the rib in oblique fashion and was amazing it was amazing this this day and here a little bit more let me show here can you see that <laughs> i'm just yeah. completing my bad english with the with the drawing <laughs> Yeah, here you were explaining uh, the direction of the cuts in, in the rib and why you think it's uh, it's stronger to cut in one fashion than the other. So it was really, really nice to yes, listen yes. to that from you. And I, probably I'm sure you're going to explain that to us. And uh, yes. So like 16 to 20 millimeters? Yes. Yes. And the slope is a 10 millimeter segment of the circle. So the slope, the curve of the uh, teeth just fits for yeah. wrist motion. Okay. That was really interesting also because people, uh, they, they, they have doubts about how using the instruments. And you taught me that you have to have an axis, right? And through this axis, you just, you don't make a lot of, um uh you don't you don't need to be strong to do to use your your saw touch them check your saw so i think it was really interesting and just one last thing before we really start here um here about your your saw your 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 rib cuts yeah the, your article right and some more things and also your saws your instruments design yeah yeah so great so okay. Dr. Uh, before we really start here we have now almost a, a 500 people watching us that's amazing um hi, tell, hi to all, yeah. yeah tell us a little bit uh you you live in ankara right you don't live in uh, stuff yes. yes and um i was so amazed how you were like an, a resident there drawing and thinking about techniques and you you were you you were making notes of the meeting so it was i was really amazed uh, with that because we don't see so so many experienced surgeons and senior surgeons like you uh so interesting about new things so it was really really interesting to see a guy with your level uh still studying and putting your mind uh, working in new concepts and new things. And I would like to know from you a little bit about uh, this, you know, uh, you are a very experienced surgeon and you designed okay. some instruments. Yeah, you designed some instruments. How is that? How is your passion for rhinoplasty? How did it start? The, the working passion of your mind, you mean? How yeah. it works? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Actually, it's uh, the the whole thing is basically the same. Actually, uh, everything connected to to uh, to each other. Let's say uh, when we when we talk about uh, the the instruments, uh, we are using with it with our hands. So the instrument uh, must fit to the to the anatomy of our hand, I mean. So uh, we need a, a very precise line of movement of the instrument. So the fixed movement is only at our wrist. Uh, so uh, if you if you try to move it with your arm, then then you cannot uh, move at the same line. So uh, you have to um, you have to need need a reference when uh, let's say modifying an instrument and and about rip uh, actually the same idea uh, it's it's about just trying to understand the nature let's say what's happening around us uh, for um, in in many of the meetings i i just mentioned that rhinoplasty 
uh, rhinoplasty is a uh, we are um, let's say even with um, when we think about a structure it is the equilibrium of forces are in balance uh, and when we touch it we just change the change its uh, its uh, intrinsic balance and we have to reconstruct a new balance uh, of uh, affecting forces so maybe uh, i will maybe i can forget to mention that so during rhinoplasty there uh, uh, there are many forces affecting that structure when we touch it then we destroy the forces more or less then we have to reconstruct a new uh, balance of forces so when we look to the structure uh, the the affecting forces are as important as the shape of the skeleton, let's say. So when you are touching the lateral cura, you have to consider its resistance uh, and affecting forces. Uh, uh, about the rib, mm, I will show that. And uh, about one hour ago, I just uh, I just draw with my phone something uh, more to to clear the explanation. Uh, you can mm, when we think about our cage. Uh, our thoracic cage, let's say, it is um, a, a preserving very important structures like heart, lung, etc. So when when the some when it, it has a trauma, then the it it have it needs to disperse or diverse the forces uh, just just laterally and and somewhat it it just flexes posteriorly and then. When the trauma goes away, then it it comes to the same position. It means that uh, when when somebody really uh, examines the histology, I'm sure that the anterior surface and posterior surface cells must be different because the posterior surface cells uh, have the capability of a little bit flexibility, so so it can absorb the force and. When we think about the uh, behavior of the costal cartilage, it is uh, so much uh, important structure must have really intrinsic, let's say, perfect capabilities. Uh, when we touch the rib, uh, I mean the, let's say, classic way, uh, it just cuts the rib in coronal section, yes, uh, coronal plane. And mm, there are three axes. You can cut cut a structure, uh, coronal plane, axial plane, and and of course sagittal plane. And we have to think about it. And sagittal plane is more or less an intact segment of the rib. It means when you take let's say five centimeters of a rib segment on the table, it just preserves its shape. So you can take one point five. Uh, millimeter thickness of a intact segment, and also it have to it have has to keep its straight form. And also, when we think about the trauma forces, uh, when we uh, just think about the anatomy of the uh, rib cage, the the forces are just let's say hitting the cage in a ninety degrees manner. So when you take a uh, take a, a very thin segment of rib intact segment uh, it it have to preserve its shape so there are three axes axial coronal and and sagittal and when we think about again the cage uh, it must have a capability to preserve its shape even under heavy traumas so uh, but of course we don't know its behavior or or the or the basic pattern, let's say. But we need uh, straight, long graphs, and we can prepare that graphs only in three axes of cut. I, I just think about that, and uh, when we compare them, them, of course, in my mind, the um, relatively less stable plane is about the, about the bending of the costal cartilage. I'm talking about the bending risk or warping risk. Relatively less stable 
uh, plane is the coronal section. A, a relatively more stable one is uh, axial section. I will show some some drawings. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I just uh, drew it a few hours ago. And uh, and the most stable uh, plane is the is the sagittal plane, and and it is the it is the basic uh, philosophy or basic idea under the uh, oblique split method. So okay. then, when you decide in your mind that the, the sagittal section um, must be more stable, then you will think that you need longer graphs, and how can you lengthen them? Just cutting it more obliquely. And then when you add a new idea, let's say there is an idea, and then and then you want you want to modify that idea, then there are uh, some possibilities appear, and then you just uh, work it on cadaver, think about it, uh, etc. Then you just uh, give a decision about the advantages and disadvantages, then choose that technique. So, and uh, as, a, as a general uh, feeling, let's say, actually uh, we are all, there's a, there is a quote about, uh, there's a metaphor, let's say, we are all dwarfs sitting on the shoulders of giants. Uh, just, just, just mentioning that um, in the past, uh, there are many scientists, philosophers, uh, philosophers, etc., and they just carried high the the knowledge level, and just just because of that, we can do better things now. And uh, if they didn't uh, found new ideas in the past, now uh, we couldn't go a little bit further than. Yes. yes. So. When, it, when I talk about balanced cross-section carving method or Gibson, I I, I always feel uh, feel respect and and I'm grateful for them because they they did the really basic and the, and the most important study in the past. So all, all the things are actually uh, complementing each other uh, yeah. because the rib is same, nature is same. And this is just the nature of the rib. And I just realized that if you cut in such a section, it will preserve its shape better. That, that's it. But uh, let's say if, if somebody says me, can you use the balanced cross-sectional carving method? Yes, of course, because I am aware uh, of the behavior of the rib. I mean behavior with the effective forces, I mean. And uh, maybe I can mention on the uh, and uh, some uh, on some diagrams, uh, there are different regions behaving a little bit different. So when you just concentrate on them, you can realize the behavior. Great, great, amazing. I hope, I hope this talk is not boring for the. Oh no, it's amazing. Yeah. You can see that it's not boring because there are 500 people watching us. So <laughs> it's yeah, not. Boring. Hey, thank you. Th 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 thank you all. Yeah, uh, yeah. We're gonna start now your your presentation. Maybe you can show your drawings because in the airplane you showed me your drawings and I could understand it perfectly. So basically, in resume, um, you compare uh, to to reach your philosophy in rib grafts. Of course, you compare with the nature of our thorax, right? And if it's protecting so important organs inside, like heart and lungs, you use that idea to uh, try to find uh, um, a pattern in, in the rib graft where it could be more resistant, right? And then right. in this way, you found, uh, you based on these studies of the past, like you said, you, you try to uh, find a, an oblique cut that it, it's stronger and more resilient to bending, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, so can you start your 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 presentation? In, in I, I, I think that um, I just planned that I say. Um, uh -huh. When we talk about the revision rhinoplasty, it's uh, it's it's the uh, basically same thing. So maybe I can uh, say a few words about let's say ear cartilage or few patients about uh, relatively 
uh, easy revision cases. Okay. And then after four or five minutes, uh, I will start the rib cartilage. And when uh, first I will just talk about the rib uh, affecting forces, how we cut it, how we prepare it, okay. and then uh, harvesting the rib. Uh, and after that, I will just uh, show how I use it. Then first, relatively simple cases, let's say septal reconstruction cases, then a little bit complex, a little bit complex, and then at the end, uh, relatively more complex ones, let's say. But uh, for me, uh, the, the, the main idea is same in, in all of the patients. Even in the uh, in the in the complex ones or or in the simple ones, uh, if the uh, so if the problems are relatively easy to solve, it, it means the the operation will finish a little bit earlier. That's it. But yeah. the main philosophy is same in in all of them. So um, for the for the listening colleagues, I want to just mention that this is just my way of thinking. If you are uh, if you are talking about this this topic, uh, maybe one hour. I, I'm not sure. So um, I just uh, want to know that they really learn something maybe different from me. If they have any further or or better opinions, also um, I want to learn from them. Uh, it will make me uh, really happy. Uh, of, of course, and then I can start the presentation. Sure, uh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's. Thank you. Okay. I'm just. Ah, uh, now you can see that. Yeah, it's perfect. Sorry. Uh, actually, when my talk. Uh, We'll finish. I will just uh, just mention two two factors. The the main determining factors in the revision rhinoplasty is the quality of skin and mucosa. And when we talk about the skeleton, uh, the main uh, determining factor is the dome. If the dome is intact, it means uh, you will perform nearly as a primary operation. Uh, it will be more controllable. The result will be more. Uh, more under control, let's say. Uh, but if the dome is not intact, and the, then the skeletal work will be a, a little bit, let's say, one step lower than than expected. So it's very important the quality of skin and mucosa and the dome is intact or not. Main aim, of course, restoration of the function and form. Autogen tissue recommended. Already we know that. Uh, I use. Uh, septal ear rib and composite ear graft and fascia. Uh, this is just about relatively simple cases because in, in many patients there are, um, when, we th when we think about DOM, uh, I mean tip, tip defining point is there because th th that is the, actually the weakest part of the structure. The, the forces coming from the cephalic, uh, cephalic part and the forces coming from the, the this red arrow coming from the caudal part, they just um, um, they just uh, here there is a let's say they, they just face at the tip defining point, and we have to know that the tip defining point is the least resistant part of the structure. So when we when we make a lateral coral steel, I mean when we bend the dome lateral to the uh, natural tip defining point, we have to know that uh, we have to perform further maneuvers to weaken that region because when the effect of the suture material ends at the postoperative period, the tip shape will not remain same as in the operation. So this is a patient. She had two previous rhinoplasties. I, I just take ear, ear cartilage. And the, the lateral curas are long, uh, so they just a little bit protruded into the vestibule. As you see, the tip is a little bit pushed caudally. So the main problem is the length, length of the lateral cura. 
when you uh, when you shorten the lateral cura, I mean uh, uh, lateral cura still and medial cura overlap, then everything will be better and also uh, other button graphs support the lateral walls. And this is a little bit uh, not difficult, but the, the, the dome is a little bit more destroyed, let's say. And of course, there are osotome, uh, open roof osotome problems. Uh, but I'm just, uh, I just want to pass these patients uh, a little bit faster because I will uh, talk about rib. So in this patient, as I mentioned, the, the dome was not intact, so th there is much work to do. Uh, the, the disadvantages in, in such patient, the, the tip rigidity, it will remain about five or six, six months, and then in time, maybe after one, one and a half year, it will become more, uh, not natural, but more, more tolerable or more flexible. So when the tip or dome cartilage is uh, destroyed, the, the, our work will be a little bit more complicated. A few words about osteotomy problems. When you face a revision patient, uh, performed uh, osteotomy is in undesired manner, let's say. First, uh, I, I just try to turn to the previous operations last step, let's say. Uh, think that, let's say, this patient operated three times previously. I, I just mobilize everything as it was during the last operation. Uh, here, I just perform on the right side. I, I perform two transverse osteotomies and, uh, and then the lateral osteotomy, just move the lateral wall. This is also true for the trauma cases, crucnosis. If, 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 if there are uh, different axes of fractures, or like these iatrogenic uh, uh, positions, you just you have to just release the skeleton at the at the same manner and then reconstruct everything again. So um, this is a six second patient. Uh, we will talk uh, we will talk on the video of this patient. Uh, I just want to show the the ear cartilage harvesting. It's a short video. Uh, I'm. Uh, I, I just uh, prefer anterior approach, as you see, and the perichondrium have to be uh, have to be undermined. Let's say the, the the perichondrium is with the flap, so the cartilage anterior surface is bare. There is no perichondrium. Here, I just reject the. Simba and Kavun Ponka separately, you see there is a three millimeter or two or three millimeter of cartilage bridge in between them. So it will it will preserve it will help to preserve the shape of the uh, ear. So the posterior part of the cartilage I reject it with the perichondrium, and this is the other part. Anterior perichondrium is with the flap. So you see there's a resistance, so the ear will preserve its shape. And there is a bridge, as, as you see. And when we open this patient's nose, you see here the, the lateral part of the lateral curas are rejected, but the dome is intact. It means uh, the tip work will be more, uh, more comfortable, let's say. They performed a medial osteotomy, but a little bit more caudally, and left side collapsed. And I will move everything. I will uh, just mobilize the skeleton. This is right side, of course. And then I will just reject that uh, small edge of right nasal bone. So I will prepare a room for the spreader graft because she, she has also functional problems. But here, the, the main trick is you, you, you'll see that left bone is a little bit um, more resection performed, collapsed, and I just provided a hole at the caudal end for further fixation. You see the spreader grafts. 
usually I uh, yes here this 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 is very important here you see only a scar tissue fibrous tissue but there is no skeleton so the 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 thickness of the spreader graft is not enough for that region i'm just inserting a piece of bone just lateralizing lateralizing the spreader graft and also it also lateralizes the nasal bone these are small other button grafts this is all native graft as you see this is uh, the crush cartilage yes this is ear cartilage supporting the infrabular region as mini shield graft assay and and again second layer of cartilage During tip work, two, two layers of cartilages are uh, are okay, but if you use three layers, the the there will be uh, circulation problems. Not circulation problems. Your your graft uh, may uh, ten, tendency to to absorb. She has a very thick skin, so uh, all my grafts are finished now. And then I just uh, I just I'm just using two pieces of perichondrium rest to provide two different tip lights. In the past, I was using more ear cartilage than rib, but but uh, but in time, um, if, if I am hesitating, uh, this patient needs ear or rib, I, I choose the rib. This is diced cartilage, uh, just for camouflaging the dorsum, and afterwards, the there is a small suturing at the uh, for to close the gap around the supratip region, and I think it's okay. And in in thick skin patients, I think. Uh, you need more vo volume of uh, skeleton, so uh, in such patients, uh, it's it will be more comfortable to use rib, I think. So the asymmetry. That's it. About rib grafting, now this is our basic topic. Uh, in in the past, uh, the the rib was uh, was basically required as a dorsal graft, but uh, after the evolution or or the the, the development of the structural approach, uh, indications of course expanded. Uh, some of the surgeons uh, hesitate to use costal cartilage because of the risks such as pneumothorax, pain, scar formation, warping problems. And this is a cadaveric cage. Uh, this is the free margin. Is the, this is the uh, sixth. Uh, sorry, eighth one, seventh, and sixth one. So I usually prefer six or seventh one, and uh, we will talk on it actually. Uh, and few words about the behavior of the rib. Uh, the synchondrous region, maybe this this region is more clear to show or clear to understand. This is the sixth one, and this region. Uh, relatively more stable than, than the other regions. If you use this region, in each direction, the, the graft uh, shape um, preserves its straight form uh, and other things. And about, this is the balanced cross-section carving method uh, segment resection, the red one. And this is oblique split uh, resection or uh, harvesting of the rib. I just reject like this. First, I, I just measure the longest graft I need. Let's say I need 3.5 centimeters. Then about four centimeters of a length I just uh, measure. And then 1.5 or 2 centimeter uh, width of uh, rib uh, block will be OK uh, or will be enough for all of the operation. Even you can perform two turanoplasties in with such a graph because you, you will use all the whole the uh, uh, cartilage. And these are, I just uh, performed them with my cell phone to 
to make clear the the idea let's say we just reject this uh, balance cross-sectional carbon graft and this is the oblique split you can carve this this segment as i mentioned uh, at the beginning uh, three different planes coronal axial or sagittal and uh, when we just just imagine that we are looking to the cross section and this is the this is the balance cross sectional uh, carving method it means coronal this is this uh, this is axial maybe here yes this these dots uh, are just trying to explain the axial of course this is not exactly axial but uh, just to just to mention the idea and and this is the uh, more or less sagittal, let's say, and this this is the oblique split method graph. So the rib is same. Just uh, this is just uh, you have to measure at the beginning of the uh, of the before harvesting. You have to measure the longest length of the graft, and then accordingly you will measure the length, and then just take like an oblique fashion. And about the harvesting. First, I will show uh, very old slides, maybe, I'm not sure, but 12 years ago, I think, because I was performing uh, three centimeter incisions, a little bit larger, so the uh, taking the photographs are uh, were more easier. So uh, the, uh, our colleagues will, will see clearly and, and understand the story, and then I will show how I am performing uh, the harvesting. So it's very important to keep muscle fibers intact, reach the anterior part of the perichondrium. This is seventh cartilage, seventh rib, and reach the anterior perichondrium. And uh, here, ash-shaped incision, but uh, I'm not performing ash-shaped now. I, I'm just performing only a, only a long incision anteriorly like this and then elevate the perichondrium, take the rib, then just close the perichondrium. Not important, but I'm just uh, performing differently. Um, elevation of the an anterior part. And then in the past, I'm just resecting two or three millimeter segments of cartilages from the medial aspect and the from the lateral aspect of the, of the rib segment. So uh, before posterior perichondrium elevation, the a uh, rib cartilage, uh, it will be more easy to, to elevate the posterior surface. And as you see, resecting segments from the medial end. And then, of course, also I, uh, I have resected a segment from the lateral end. And then easily I just elevate the posterior perichondrium. You see the posterior perichondrium intact like this. And then muscle fibers more or less intact, perichondrium intact. This is the segment. And then first uh, close the perichondrium uh, and then uh, repair the fascia. Now I'm using uh, this like hand saw, let's say. Uh, first performing the lateral and medial aspects of the rib. I just cut with this saw. I'm, uh, I, I'm just feeling uh, the cut, the depth, everything, and then uh, I'm just rotating the instrument and then can see the depth also. But you can feel every uh, cut of the instrument because you are feeling with your, uh, we are feeling with our hands, of course. This is about the endoscopic, and uh, this is the eighth one, this is the seventh one. The use of endoscope in rib harvesting is only for, I think, um, educational purposes to show the what's happening inside, uh, because the most important thing is to uh, work with bimanual and and under binocular vision. And here, it's uh, maybe in uh, maybe ten seconds. You you, you just uh, it it will help to see you are under perichondrium or not, but uh, it's not so important. So. Now, uh, how I am harvesting the rib. The incision, uh, of course, you can take it from one centimeter, but I think 1.5 centimeter is uh, ideal for the incision uh, size. Maybe we can 
talk uh, later about the uh, about this video because it, I think I have this video again in a patient's uh, video. So this is the muscle fascia, as you see. I just make an in incision to the muscle, then reach to the anterior perichondrium, and in this patient, I'm. Yes, I just perform a perichondrial incision with monopolar. And then as I showed you, I just perform oblique cuts to the gland resection segment. You see this is, a, I think, lateral aspect. And, and this is the medial aspect. And after the rib will be more flexible, then it will be very easy to elevate the posterior perichondrium. Maybe it's better to mention that um, the incision, uh, yes, here again, I have to explain something. Yeah, this is what happened inside, medial side, lateral side. I just perform such cuts and then elevate the posterior surface with, with an elevator and then take the rib out. And when we measure it, you see that it's about four centimeter in length and 1.5 centimeter in thickness and checking for pneumothorax, as you see. So about the incision, a few words. Of course, 1.5 centimeter is uh, is enough. If you if you perform, let's say one one centimeter, then the the the, the flap edges will be more traumatized, and uh, at the postoperative period there will be more scar formation, or um, the scar will be more visible. Um, in less experienced surgeons, I think uh, they can easily perform between two and three centimeters, but uh, you don't need to perform an incision more than three centimeters. And prevention about the prevention of graft warping, uh, Gibson and Davis mentioned that the only definitive method to overcome cartilage warping is to avoid cartilage carving. Uh, they are just trying to mention the, the behavior of the rib, actually. Um, but we need straight grafts. This is balanced cross-section carving method. This is, I think this is not due to the Due to the technique, the, the surgeon actually uh, couldn't understand the, the nature or the, the behavior of the costal cartilage. So uh, when we take the rib out, you see uh, bended different directions. She had four or five times operated previously, and when we take the dorsal on the graph, it, it also bended. Um, I'm trying to say that you have, we have to understand the uh, natural behavior of the rib. Uh, so you can cut the rib in three different directions. If you are aware of the affecting forces, it doesn't matter for the surgeon because uh, if we know, we can control that forces. In the past, um, many different uh, authors perform different things, as you know, uh, Gunter with uh, uh, cover stabilization. Another uh, colleague used two different graphs uh, face to face. Uh, these are uh, cadaveric graphs, ca ca cadaver graphs. Uh, or, you know, dice cartilage in fascia, but this is only for dorsal only graft. Or another uh, author performed multiple partial cuts to um, uh, to break the forces, but this is also on the graft. Another um, colleague from Turkey also performed the same idea. And as I mentioned, we need straight grafts in varying thicknesses. Oblique split method, uh, this is oblique split method, just splitting the rib in an oblique fashion, that, that's it. So um, when you need longer grafts, of course, we need, uh, as I showed, the, the harvesting part. 
uh, we usually need 3.5 or 4 centimeter of uh, of graphs, and maybe a few words at the at the peripheral region here. Let's say, of course, there is not a uh, not a clear border, but the the peripheral cells tends to contract, and the central cells tends to uh, tends to expand, and and they are in equilibrium. So when we when we carve, let's say. Uh, only one periphery and uh, the equilibrium of forces changes and this graph just tends to work to the other side uh, it will be at the same plane but tends to uh, tends to bend to the to the other side so uh, there are many differences in patient patients rib behaviors uh, what i mean let's say if there are 100 revision cases and you perform revision Probably, uh, if we think really in detailed manner, all of the patients' ribs dif uh, more or less behave differently. So uh, this is just a just a, not an advice, but I cannot find the correct word. Uh, sorry about the, about the English. So uh, when you morphologically see the graft, if there are gaps, clefts. Uh, so it means that if you carve or if you cut only a strip of cartilage, then all the force equilibrium will change and, and you cannot control it. Maybe in 100 or 200, in 100 on, or 200 patients, maybe one or two patients, you will face such a situation. So if you look to the surface and the surface is not morphologically uh, homogeneous, the behavior will be different. If the cartilage is a little bit more ossified, then there will be no bending problems. But in such patients, cartilages will not suitable for the lateral coral reconstruction because we need a little bit curved grass for lateral coral reconstruction. We will talk about it. Uh, I per, I, we have performed the cadaveric study or uh, animal study. It's uh, not necessary to talk about it. This is the article. Uh, this is a very old video just to show the the behavior of the cartilage. Actually, this is I, I'm just um, artificially left the cartilage to dry on the table. One side is in paper thin. This is about 10 or 12 years ago, I think. I'm not sure. One side dried faster than the other, and it bended. You will see that. And uh, and then I will just immerse it into a solvent solution when hydrated again then the then the shape uh, becomes straight again this is just to convince the listeners uh, because uh, just uh, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, uh, go to a conclusion from this video I'm just uh, try to show the surprising changes so and this is again the same slide just to just to remind you of the complete balance cross-sectional carving and uh rejecting the rib like this uh in about two two or three years ago i just performed in few in few patients for to provide lateral coral stress it just curved blade and then just cut in this manner uh, actually it works but um I, I I don't advise to perform this because everything must be homogeneous. Now the blade is straight and then the graft is straight. So this is you cannot rely this this uh, curved blade. But I ch I performed in the past and it 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 worked uh, enough. So now I'm performing like this dermatome. I'm using dermatome blade. It's very important to perform a homogeneous cut. So. Because if, if your cut is not homogeneous, if you are using a number 15 blade, then the surface uh, will not be homogeneous. So the forces will not be homogeneous and the cartilage uh, cannot preserve its straight form. And you can provide many graphs, but if, the, if this video will not work, it's not important. I will just, sorry, I'm trying to, oh, sorry. 
Huh. Then uh, let's say we have we have uh, we have a straight graph, but we need curved graphs for lateral coral reconstruction. So if you just carve the periphery of the graph like this, of course in a controlled manner, then it it becomes uh, curved graphs. So it's very important lateral lateral coral reconstruction. Uh, must have to be performed with curved graphs. Uh, sorry, this video. Uh, and oblique split method provides straight graphs, uh, and you can provide all of the graphs from one piece of oblique split graph, um, except lateral, uh, except l strut reconstruction, and sometimes dorsal only graph. And this is septal strut caudal part. This is uh, about 10 or 12 years ago uh, for the for the publication. Uh, so I'm using the septal septal replacement graphs in one millimeter thickness because one millimeter thickness is enough. If you use thicker graphs, it means that you are just obstructing the nasal passage with such graphs. Uh, about dorsal only graphs, you can. Uh, put them side by side, uh, end to end, et cetera, or you can cover with perichondrium for camouflaging. Air structure construction performed. And dorsal on the graph, you see here, you see the postal perichondrium on lateral aspects of the graph to provide smooth transition. This patient also belongs to about, I think, to 11 or 12 years ago. Uh, this article is about the oblique split technique septal reconstruction and uh, also about the dorsal only graft, as I, I showed this video, yes. And another option, uh, when you need, um, uh, about, I'm just to, to say a few words about the diced cartilage in fascia. These are oblique split metal grafts. I just put them like this and, and over it, diced cartilage in fascia as uh, Master Daniel's uh, uh, method, let's say. And here's a patient, uh, but about last, I think four years, I'm not using diced cartilage in fascia because fascia behaves as a barrier to the diced cartilage, I think. Uh, so there are so many young colleagues listening to us and if, if they have energy to work this or study this, they can study because I'm sure uh, fascia behaves as a barrier. So. Uh, if your dorsal only graft is a little bit thicker than uh, two millimeters, uh, have more risk of absorption. Uh, I'm, I'm not using, I'm just using dice cartilage and just costal perichondrium over it. And about the costal perichondrium, the cartilage surface have to be at the same anatomic position. The cartilage surface, surface face or looks to the skeleton uh, and few case studies. This is a simple case. Uh, he had two previous septoplasties. He he doesn't have any any aesthetic uh, aesthetic perception or aesthetic uh, desires. I say, but uh, there is uh, there is a narrow segment of septum and it is deviated. He he just wants to be operated for functional reasons. Uh, like this, and and when we open the nose, the the, the septum uh, severely uh, deviated at the uh, junction of ethmoid and and the septal cartilage, and also uh, here is a second uh, fracture line, and so the height of the caudal septum was not enough. I already showed this rib cartilage harvesting. Uh, I can pass this video or if you uh, need to, if you have questions, I can talk about harvesting details if you uh, want or, or I, I can just, uh, I can just. Um, uh, yeah, you, you can you can continue with Dr. Dashtan. Uh, and, then, and then I will talk about uh, about different things uh, again. So uh, about uh, mm, I have mentioned few words about the incision, um, and now the about the pain. Uh, it's it is very important to preserve the muscle fibers. The most important one is muscle fibers. 
So just dissect the muscle fibers, just separate and open a window. Um, and, uh, and it's better to repair uh, the fascia also. If you preserve the fascia and if you preserve the muscle fibers, the patient uh, will have very minimum or no discomfort at the postoperative period. And and the other thing, uh, you you can uh, I, I'm I'm usually taking the anterior part of the perichondrium because uh, I there are nearly fifty percent of cases are revision cases and they had operated. Uh, more than let's say two times. So uh, I, I mentioned that the cartilage surface of the perichondrium have to face to the skeleton. Uh, and, uh, and the other thing about the dorsal only graft, uh, the dice cartilage, uh, it's uh, if you need two millimeter dorsal augmentation, maybe at most three millimeter, you can use dice cartilage and over it, costal perichondrium. But if you need more dorsal augmentation, it's better to better to use rigid cartilage graft and over it, let's say less than two millimeter uh, bulk of two millimeter thickness of dice cartilage graft will be okay. Yes, here is the old split method grafts. First, I just, uh, I'm just trying to reconstruct the uh, L, L strut. Uh, I provided a hole at the caudal edges of the nasal bones and fixate them with PDS and uh, inserted the caudal strut and fixating them now. As I mentioned, this is a basic operation and in, uh, there are so many patients uh, need uh, septal uh, strut reconstruction about functional reasons. And our new strut have to be fixed at the caudal end of nasal bone cephalically and at the, around the nasal spine, as you see. Then just fixated the upper laterals. This is six of PDS, and I think it's okay. Sorry, this is postoperative result. I'm just going a little bit faster, and here. It's, here's a classical saddle set, nose deformity. I will just show the pictures because I showed uh, his, uh, this um, slide before. Estrat reconstruction, dorsal only graft, and a little bit a small radius graft, etc. And the, as you see, the, the type of or the shape of estrat reconstruction. Uh, Postoperative result. The, uh, I use fascia at the, at the lateral aspects of the uh, dorsal and leg graft to, to have a smooth transition, to provide smooth transition. Uh, you can use crush, crush cartilage or dice cartilage, uh, but um, it's, it, it, it's better to not to use the dorsal and leg graft uh, alone because in time there will be there will be clear transition. So, so you have to camouflage the lateral aspects of the dorsal and leg graft. And uh, he had three previous arplasties, ear cartilage, etc. Then I just uh, take rib and also left lateral wall collapsed. Uh, functional problems basically, and the the previous surgeon used as um, supply graft from ear, so it it uh, provide a prominence here. So basically, all button grafts, dorsal nerve graft, out fracture and basic maneuvers. Uh, so, and another, uh, not difficult, but a, a little bit uh, relatively complicated uh, when we compare with the previous ones. The long lateral cura, they are, mm, uh, they are bulged into the vestibule and also the, maybe, I uh, guess, here, the, the, the this this attachment around the uh, cartilage and the and the ethmoid bone that area destroyed and and there is a saddle like appearance if you see such a patient here is a depression 
and here is a little bit up. It, it, it means there is a tilt, this area down, this area up. Uh, uh, it means the, the attachment of the cartilage to ethmoid bone is not intact now. So reconstructing the septum, fixating to the nasal bones, but basically the lateral cura uh, length arrange, it means lateral cura still uh, medial overlap, and uh, long and strong curved lateral coral stratigraphs to open the nasal valve, as you see. And this is another patient, and she, she I just, she, I will show a short video. I just put two, two videos of the patient. One is, I think, 1.5 or two minutes. The other is, I think, six minutes, I think. but. Uh, uh, the the basic idea is same, so I I, I can show the short one. Uh, sure, sure. Everybody's loving. Because uh, maybe it will be boring, so, uh, so I can no, show you. You can go on. A lot of people. We still have from the beginning to now six hundred people watching. <laughs> this is the short one. Did it work? Yes. There are also some scars here, as you see. This is 1.5 minutes. Uh, and lateral coral still, medial coral overlap, but the, the skeleton uh, not so um, strong, let's say. And l reconstruction. The segmental l reconstruction is is advantage because because you can arrange the rotation height etc and then fixate the the two legs of the strut and this is lateral cross strut uh, this a little bit curved graph this one and fixated we, we, we will also discuss uh, is it better to uh, insert it over the lateral cura rest or under uh, i'm usually uh, placing it over the lateral cura, but uh, in some patients, uh, it is better to put it uh, on under. So in more collapsed patients, it is better to put it under, but but generally over. So uh, you see dice cartilage over it, costal perichondrium, and also I camouflaged tip grafts, infrabular area, everything with the, with the rib perichondrium. So, uh, if you use um, rib perichondrium, it also provides something soft tissue padding like effect, and the skin quality uh, will become a little bit better in time. It's uh, interesting, and maybe the uh, maybe the colleagues wants to ask that I'm I'm not using fat injection or something like that. Uh, I'm sure it 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 it, 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 it works better, but I faced many patients. Uh, seeking for revision and in let's say uh, around third revision somebody uh, performed fat injection and there is uh, probably infection and also skin contracture etc so i'm just as a as an anti surgeon i'm just just afraid to uh, to inject uh, fat to the tissue planes but uh, as Torimi performed it, it it will be more logical we use microfet or or nanofet about uh, for to support the stem cell activity uh, with the pericostal pericondrium or or fascia. Um, so I, I I don't have enough experience to 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 give advice about fat injection. And this is a long one. Yes, this is the long term. Uh, so. The, the, the patient is living in another city, so she had uh, photo, she took photographs in uh, that city. So after many attempts, we have these photographs from the patient. So um, this is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the uh, cartilage to ethmoid junction that 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 area is not intact, uh, and also a crook nose. Uh, you see the facial asymmetry. This the, the right side of her 
face is smaller than the left side. And it's very important to uh, clearly explain the patient what will be corrected or what will not be corrected, let's say. So uh, her facial asymmetry will stay same. The, the, the base asymmetries uh, will be same, maybe better, but uh, you, you cannot correct it. Uh, in such patients, I'm performing other, other base release. I mean, I'm just undermining this area under the per, uh, periosteum. Maybe we'll talk later. So Kirk knows the, this, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a detachment here. And also she had um, septal perforation. So I will not show septal perforation video, but uh, what I had performed, I, I just, uh, uh, in the past, about 10, ten years ago, I just, uh, uh, I, just think about septal perforation repair. There are so many techniques, but in uh, spatial situations, uh, you can use inferior turbinate composite graft for, for repair. If your flaps cannot uh, close the gap enough, then you can just, uh, just insert a composite graft here. The black area is bone and the gray areas are mucosa. Or you can just directly close with a composite graft. But uh, uh, of course, this is not our discussion. In this patient, I just um, I just elevate bipedical flaps and the remaining gap I, I just closed with a composite graft. Uh, in such patients, if this patient has septal perforation at the same time, it's very important to cover the, sep uh, the, the spreader grafts or, or L-strat component with the mucosa. So your, um, your superior flap, uh, you have to leave at least five or seven millimeters of mucosa here. So this is post result. As you see, the facial asymmetry is same, but uh, the rest is reconstructed. This is a little bit more complicated, let's say. Uh, she had, uh, I'm not sure what three, uh, yes, three previous rhinoplasties. Uh, on the dorsum, uh, this patient has a video. You will see that there is a med pore. Uh, she has a bad odor, uh, something uh, in, in, inside, uh, I mean, tissue reaction. So in such patients, it's difficult because uh, this such, such alloplast uh, changes the skin quality. They uh, very strictly adhere to the subcutaneous tissues and you are you you have to uh, uh, separate the flap from the implant uh, millimeter by millimeter, let's say, and you see you see the dome is not intact and interestingly destroyed, and as you see, and here the lateral part is intact but the dome destroyed. Uh, And here is then also metaphor at the cardless figure. This is just to show you the how the skin affected and how, how it is difficult to to elevate the skin. And this is the graft. The graft uh, provided a capsule like something like that. And at the at the midline, the skin is uh, become very thin, and uh, there is a there is a capsule-like bed on the dorsum. You will see that, like this. And uh, and I thought that it's better to fill that space with similar graft. Uh, this is the this is another metaphor supporting the caudal part. This is the oblique split graft, about three three point three something like that. And this is the width, about eight, eighth millimeter, I think. And first, providing a straight septum and the spreader grass. Mm. 
you see the dome. And uh, I just try to, uh, of course, there are many options. Uh, and first, uh, you see umbrella like graft here, and then repairing the lateral aspects or the remaining lateral cross to that. Of course, you can you can reconstruct it separately, but um, during the operation, it seems nice. But in in time, the, you, you you cannot be sure about uh, how how a bended rib uh, reconstructing the middle core. Let's say we cannot be sure about how how it will behave in 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 time. So uh, you see the graphs at the base. The there's an the umbrella like. Yes, it's better to talk about this. You see, this is another graft. This is not oblique split graft. This is just anterior surface of the graft taken, anterior surface of a rib taken with anterior perichondrium. I'm making multiple parallel millimetric cuts, as you see. There are many pieces attached to the perichondrium. You see that it is nearly the same uh, volume with the alloplast filling the same capsular bed like this. The, the perichondrium uh, will behave, as I mentioned, as a soft tissue pad and also uh, the, the skin quality is uh, interestingly better at the, at the postoperative period when you use costal perichondrium. This is postoperatively, the skin seems good, but um, you see the tip. The there is a there are subcutaneous changes. There are, as, as I mentioned, uh, the 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 tissue changes and and you cannot provide a natural subcutaneous uh, tissue in such alloplast used patients. So this is another patient. I I, I just prefer to hide her eyes. Uh, she had. Uh, I think two previous sternoplasties. This area collapsed. Uh, also, we have her video. One video is about six minutes. The other is, I think, about two minutes. We will choose the uh, shorter one again. So this area is a little bit more laterally, laterally positioned. This area collapsed. And the, the other thing is they performed other base resections, but the nostrils are small. Uh, but uh, still, uh, she, she, the, functionally, we, we, we don't need to widen it. But if we, if we try to perform scar resection, the nostrils will be more uh, narrower. Then there will be functional problems. So I just explained the patient that I will not touch the bases. And uh, the main problem is uh, short nose uh, it's really too small and uh, and very rigid so it will be a little bit um, uh, difficult to um, to make a bigger nose to, to lengthen the nose so uh, i just rest these bony protrusions on lateral wall and left nasal bone i just lateralized that as such a construction lateral crural are reconstructed with curved oblique split grass I think at the, at the end of this talk, uh, maybe this is very important to, to remember. Lateral crural strut grafts or lateral crural reconstruction graft uh, have to be a curved one. If you use straight grafts, uh, it will you will see that it's nice in, 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 at the operating room, but uh, at the postoperative period, you, you will have functional problems. So uh, a little bit modified rim grafts, infradible air graft, camouflage with costal perichondrium, and dice cartilage with costal perichondrium, as I mentioned. And you see there is no dome. This, uh, they, they resected this area, and also this segment resected. There is no upper lateral cartilage. There is only maybe three millimeter rest, and the, and the rest is on its scar tissue. Here is the rest. That's it. And there is a small piece of septum. Uh, first, I performed the lateral uh, estrat reconstruction, of course, and then uh, for to support and the lengthen the nose, uh, tongue and groove fashion, I fixated the medial middle crural rest. You see the curved graft. 
and then I provided a here is just a partial incision and it will behave like a dome and fixate it that the fixate to that um, cartilage and scar tissue rest and fixating everything together, domicalization, and uh, the, they will have similar uh, uh, angulations. This is the only septal cartilage rest uh, in the septum. These, these are behave as uh, rim grafts, just uh, supporting that region. And post perichondrium, sorry, yes. And this is the post operative Period. You see, I just uh, lengthen and an increased projection, and the uh, nostril shape uh, turned into ellipse. Uh, I, I didn't touch the nostrils and uh, lengthened, and that's it. And this is more complicated because she has, um, uh, as I mentioned, to, to, uh, the the main determining factor is the quality of the skin and mucosa. In about the skeleton dome, and you see, uh, she had two previous rhinoplasties. But a young colleague uh, during the last operation, she had thick skin. She wanted a narrower tip, and uh, our colleague performed skin resection from here. Uh, you see the scar tissue like this, and the nostrils are uh, like this now. Yes, shortened nose contracted and and skin resection performed around these regions uh, so um, we we have to first we have to decide uh, open or close approach uh, i just thought that because i had uh, i had pre um, i had experience from previous patients during the operation i opened the nose i reconstruct everything the skeleton is good but when i try to close the flap then it's really difficult to close then then again i uh, just uh, try to reject uh, a projected skeleton so in such a patient there will be uh, uh, circulation problems and if you open such a nose probably it will be very difficult uh, to to close the uh, incision and this is from the operating room first performing the same Incisions like this, very narrow uh, nostrils, and I'm just showing this because it's it's really boring to to elevate the flaps. Uh, I just want you to understand that the main determining factor is the quality of skin and mucosa. That, that's it. In in the the summary of revision revision cases is, I think, that. So uh, during the operation, you will see that this uh, the the infralobular and tip region will will become purple during the operation because there is no circulation. I just elevate everything and then uh, inserted. Spreader grafts, I will fixate at the caudal part, but at the cephalic part, I just inserted them in a narrow pocket because it's really hard to uh, foot suture uh, cephalically. This is caudal extension graft, but I will, of course, I will fixate it and then. Um, the flap will not adapt to the graft, and then uh, I will uh, millimeter by millimeter, I will just reject and shorten the caudal extension graft. You see, these are thin grafts to support the area. This is actually not an aesthetic pro procedure. This is an this is an organ uh, preservation. I'm just summarizing the incisions. You see, here's a mini flap for forming the apex. Here's a mini flap to the base, like this. And in this patient, I just hesitate to use uh, composite graft because 
if it will not uh, work, uh, the, everything will be worse. This is crash cartilage graft. You, you see the, the color of the skin here. And um, in young patients, uh, you can uh, crash the rib cartilage, uh, but but usually it's it's uh, it's not suitable for crushing. This is costal perichondrium, as you see. For soft tissue support, and uh, it will also support the base of the scars. Uh, so it will not, they will not reflect the light. So they will not uh, uh, so much um, pay attention, let's say. This is the only septal graft. There are two pieces because uh, I, I hope to have two different light, light reflexes, but the skin is really thick and scarred. And this is 10 days postoperatively. Um, I think what you when you perform um, perform the the operation, it's really important to use nose retainers at the postoperative period in such patients. If you don't use uh, such a nose retainer, I think your operation success uh, will be uh, really lower than you expect. So um, she will use that nose retainers uh, around six months, uh, eight hours a day, and uh, at least three months, but um, it's better to use about six months. Uh, you see, you, you, there is there the um, there is no shadow, so so we cannot see the we we cannot uh, see the scars clearly. And she also sent the photos from a different country, uh, so the photo the quality of the photographs maybe uh, is not so suitable. You see the mini flap here, and like this. So, what about the long term? This 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 photograph is not belong to the patient. I will show, but this is the same maneuver at the base. And two different two um, all accepted method graphs side by side over it. Dice dice cartilage fascia, and the, the, this patient had three previous anaplasties, uh, uh, and uh, after one year the this oblique split method graft edges become uh, visible from outside. And then I will, I, I just take the grafts out, scrap with scalpel and insert it back. So this is the one year post-operative. Post uh, I'm just trying to show uh, how the oblique split method grafts behave after one year, let's say. Costal cartilage uh, elevation from the skin is very easy because it it, it doesn't adhere uh, to the subcutaneous tissues tightly. It's very loose. You see, even the sharp bevel edges are seen. Everything is same, straight, and no absorption. And after one year, this is the situation of the grass. And uh, so. This method provides the trade graphs in varying thicknesses. As I mentioned, the limiting factor is not the cartilage, the quality of skin and mucosa. Oh, sorry, this is this is a course we are performing, but this year, of course, we have just postponed it uh, for uh, to the end of the year. And uh, maybe already you know the the Instagram, but these are my. Uh, social media things, let's say. And I think this is okay for revision cases. Uh, now, what do you want to do? Do you, do you want to ask questions or shift to the certain instruments? Hi, Professor Tustin. was so great and so far. Uh, amazing results, everybody here our texting comments here that your results are amazing and how great yeah, thank you for listening thank you yeah thank you so much i think it really caught the attention of everybody because everybody's from the beginning from the beginning uh to this point of your lecture everybody is here and yes it's uh, i would say personally i started using oblique split method after 
meeting you in the airplane and mm -hmm. yeah and so far it's really life-changing okay i think uh even for young surgeons or more senior surgeons uh sometimes we're a little resistant to change what we're, what we do in our routine of course it's it's difficult sometimes to leave our comfort zone but uh the first time i tried the oblique split method i was amazed how could i uh do some very thin cuts and it wouldn't bend so it was really good for me uh i know that so many experienced surgeons uh each one has his own technique to harvest and to work on their cartilages rib cartilages but um especially for beginners or or for younger surgeons it's a very nice method the oblique split method because uh there's not so many secrets you know you don't have to yeah you just put it following your your article and your instructions and it's amazing because it doesn't bend so it's really good uh it one uh less uh one less thing to worry about in the post operation so it's really nice and really useful i'm using a lot of this and thank you so much for sharing this knowledge yeah and, thank you yeah and it's also amazing because like i always say it's uh maybe just a few people have this opportunity to have a very long and complete le lecture with you because when you we see you in the meetings it's just 10 minutes Uh, so, yes, eight minutes, ten minutes. Uh, in in such short talks, uh, everybody trying to uh, show that he's a good surgeon, but yeah. um, it's, it's 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 not important. The the most important thing is to is to discuss. Uh, so, as I mentioned uh, during the um, during the beginning, uh, if if the if our colleagues. Uh, have better idea or or any advice i'm happy to hear happy to learn that so but uh, eight minutes talks is is only just 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 a talk i think very very few knowledges we can take from from such uh, talks okay. and uh, about the about oblique split method as i mentioned an experienced surgeon can use both of uh, all the three axes balance cross section carving other axial cut, let's say, and, and also oblique split. But if you are not experienced enough, uh, it's better to use a more reliable way. So oblique split method graphs really do not bend. In which situations there is a bending risk? I just have mentioned that if you look morphologically to the graft and, and uh, on the surface of the graft, there are collapse, there are not fibrous tissue, not cartilage. If there are such transitions, if you if you destroy the continuity or the um, if you if you cut from one side or car, uh, if you make an incision from one side, all the forces uh, behave differently. So you cannot use that graft. But such a graft, such a such a morphologically different graft, maybe they will face one patient be between 100 patients let's say uh, but when they face such a such a graft they they just uh, it's it's better to take uh, to take it in our mind that the that graft behaves differently and the other thing if the rib is naturally curved uh, if you use relatively straight segment it it is more it will be more efficient if you include the Uh, synchondrous region, then it's very um, efficient. But if you use or have to use the curved segment of a rib, then at the tips of the graft, about one or two millimeters at the tips, um, the the forces of one side is cartilage, the other side is mostly peripheral cells, the perichondrial side. So that one or two millimeter tip tends to bend, but if you cut that one or two millimeter, that's it. So uh, if it is ossified, there is not a bending risk, of course, but uh, it's it's a little bit difficult to, not difficult, but not comfortable to carve a, a lateral cross strut graft. These are uh, things just, uh, uh, I cannot find the correct word, but uh, 
only things in my mind now. Uh, if I remember something, of course, add, add all of them. If any questions about this, I, we can talk or go on, whatever. Maybe, maybe uh, your lecture was so interesting and we, we have so many things to, to discuss around, around the subject of rhinoplasty. Maybe you could talk a little bit about your instrument because I found it also very useful and uh, you really uh, think when you, maybe I think when you design your instruments, you think in a way to make our lives easier because it's so useful, your saws and I'm using your, your saw, Tashtan Chakir sauce. And mm. could you show a little bit about that? Yes, of course, this is, uh, this is, uh, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, it's great. Uh, yes. And uh, this is through all rhinoplasty techniques, maneuvers, everything. There is not a best and standard technique in rhinoplasty. And also there is not a best and standard instrument, I think. And uh, when we talk about osteotomy, the aim is not only to mobilize and narrowing, but also to control the the amount. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a cadaver and you see everything is free enough, but, but do not collapse. So it's better to provide a hinge uh, around lateral cura to transverse osteotomy transition. Uh, and this is the clinical equivalent of the, of the mm, bony work. Everything is mobile enough, but, but do not collapse. Uh, I'm using micro saws, mini rasps, and 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 micro saw for lateral uh, This is these are in the past, and after that, about four years ago, I just uh, start to use piezo. After about 100 patients, I just quit to use it, and instead I designed these transverse and medial lateral uh, osteotomy saws. Uh, you see at the lower piezo near uh, middle uh, micromotor and that's the micro saw and the tips are uh, the tip is um, narrower than piezo piezo is about 0.6 uh, micromotor and micro saw is about 0.4 millimeters as i mentioned it works with your hand and only wrist motion like this as you see the wrist motion only circular motions and uh, during our journey on the on the airplane, I just I just wrote that if you take a pencil and you just make rotational movements with your wrist, you you will find the find the curve of the teeth. And this is my operating table about I think four years. Uh, this this angulated one is for rib. And these are also mini rasps for um, rasp the lateral osteotomy or anterior maxilla. Uh, I have showed this one. Uh, it's so it, I'm just showing this here because uh, manual instrument you, we are we are feeling with our fingertips. So when you use a manual instrument, you can feel uh, everything in a detailed manner. When when you are using an electronic instrument due to vibration, the the touch sensation will be low, so it's just to just to remember that it's not important. And uh, after we have met with Burish, he designed the concave radix one. So we just call this family Tashtan Chakar, and uh, collaboration is good, uh, is good always. And this is medial osteotomy, just to show from outside. I'm just providing a gap between septum and the nasal bone these areas as you see and uh, it's about 40 45 degrees of uh, and this is important as i sh as we talked this is real time video it takes about 30 seconds to perform the transverse osteotomy uh, just slight pressure just grasp the bone if you press too much, you cannot cut, uh, and the teeth must be clean. If there is any soft tissue touching the teeth, then it, it, it will not work. This is the right side from inside. Like the, this motion is like this in a circular way, and I showed this one, and this is the 
motion of the bones. Of course, after lateral osteotomy, I'm using uh, three millimeter lateral uh, uh, micro osteotomy for lateral osteotomy. This is from inside. This, this presentation, I think it, it will take totally eight minutes, something like that. It's short. Uh, transverse one. You see the circular motion just showing the the motion. Yes, that's it. I'm using both hands, but here just to show uh, with the endoscope, I'm just trying to make the circular motion to uh, explain this one. So slight pressure uh, and same same line circular motion from wrist. And uh, sorry, I have showed this one. It's not important. Uh, I'm using lateral osteotomy so uh, for revision cases, but I have showed this one. So about lateral osteotomy, micro osteotomy. If your micro osteotomy is thin and sharp enough, then you can uh, you do not have uncontrolled fractures. But if your osteotomy is thick or blunt, then you have problems. So. Um, this is a patient from past. You will see, can you see the lateral osteotomy line here? Now, yes, uh, yes. Uh, I'm just to try to mention that the, uh, you, you can cut very, very precisely if your osteotomy is thin and sharp. So this is only for to say that I'm performing rhinoplasty, not important. <laughs> Everybody shows post-operative cases to, 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 to say this. So. In in such in such patients, the you, the osteotomy uh, you if you have control over osteotomy, our stress will be lower than usual. Uh, so, um, in such patients, let's say, of course, the axis deviation is not much, but one side you have to provide a hinge, as I mentioned, around transverse and lateral osteotomy region. Uh, you have to lateralize this one, but this one, you have to again provide a hinge around transverse and lateral osteotomy transition. Then you have to rotate medially this side to provide uh, more straighter nose. And uh, also um, a very short nasal bone. Uh, in such patients, even if you can uh, provide a hinge around this region, even in such patients, you will not have, have any uncontrolled collapse, something etc. like that. So when I need uh, mini rasps, uh, in such patients, asymmetric face, deviated and a little bit crooked nose. So I just rasp this area anterior maxilla and, and the rest is a little bit asymmetric osteotomies. Uh, and in in such patients, if, if, uh, if the... Um, if the pyramid, uh, you have difficulty in uh, putting it midline, may, sometimes you have to perform double osteotomies here. Uh, the double osteotomies, um, there is a uh, two or three millimeter of uh, height difference between the two levels. Uh, you, you, you just perform a little bit two or three millimeter higher level of osteotomy then uh, the second is two or three millimeter lower, and uh, this segment will be more medialized. Then the pyramid will be uh, will become midline uh, more easily. But in this patient, I only used only rasps, rasping this area. And of course, there are so many maneuvers. Uh, so this was from from a meeting, of course. Uh, Leonardo's quote: "Learn how to see." and realize that everything connects to everything else. Uh, again, my addresses. Uh, yes, I, I think that's it for osteotomy. But if there are any questions, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, answer them. Yeah, it's, it's great, great. I'm, I'm using this and it's incredible how fast it is to do the fracture because uh, it really cuts really nice one, but um I, I learned first from Baris and then you you explained to me the same thing you have to have an axis right you have to really make your movement movement of that on the axis of your hand and wow. this way it really works well it was 
really nice to have this. And yes, and, and Dr. Tashkanistan, we, we already have almost two hours here talking about rhinoplasty. And it's amazing because it, 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 we still have so many things to talk about. And uh, one thing I, I would like to congratulate you is how people like you right around the world because it's one of the uh, highest number of subscriptions we had so far. And people really like you probably because not only because you're a great surgeon, but also because you're so humble and, uh, and yeah. because you're so humble, you're always growing and always keeping your mind open to uh, new things and to improve yourself. And I, I really like to thank you for the opportunity for us to be here and to learn from you with this uh, complete lecture for more than one hour lecture. Uh, in, in this kind of lecture, we can really learn from you and not just see some of your cases, but really learn from you. And it was really amazing, amazing, really great. I, um, I want to thank you also for the, for the invitation, of course, and, and especially uh, for my colleagues uh, listening us uh, for I think more than one and a half an hour or oh, nearly two hours and so uh, really I um, I want to thank you for 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 all of them oh thank you Dr. Tashton um, so because uh, we're I know it's already late in some in, in Turkey in yeah. Ankara and uh, we're already talking here for almost two hours, okay? Um, today, I, I'm not, I, I'm gonna save your energy, all right? I'm not gonna open for so many questions, all right? And I, again, I would like, just like to thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, now we still have a little bit of your time with our mentoring group, okay? Uh, our mentor mentoring group that probably they're mm -hmm. listening here. Uh, we still have some minutes with Dr. Tashton. He's gonna uh, talk to us a little bit with uh, about some subjects. Um, and I'd like, again, to thank everybody here, people from all over the world, subscribe for this, people from Australia, from Russia, from uh, Turkey, Europe, and Latin America, Thank United so States. Too. So a lot of people love you, and because what I said, because not because you're just a good surgeon, but because you're a, a great human being. Thank you so much, Dr. Tashton. Uh, thank, thank you to, thank you to all, all of our colleagues, and and maybe in in future we will learn something from them. There are so many young surgeons, I think, listening us. So thank you to all of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, ju I'm just checking here. We had so far mo more than a thousand five hundred people watching us. S sorry, how much? How many? A thousand five hundred people. Thousand five hundred. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is really a big, big sur sur surprise for me. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, all right, Dr. Tashin, I'm gonna. Um, uh, 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 talk a little bit with people here and then I come yeah. back to you. Okay? Thank you so okay. much. Okay, thank you. See you. Thank you. Uh, all right, guys. Thank you again. Uh, you are awesome as always. Uh, one more time, we had uh, a lot of people from all over the world here with us. And one more time, learning a lot about rhinoplasty. Uh, a lot of rhinoplasty lovers here and a great opportunity to be with you and a good way for us to make the best of our time during these pandemia days. A lot of people are uh, really crazy to go back to the operating room because we love what we do. And I'd like to thank you all, okay? Gracias a todos amigos de Latinoamérica, siempre con nosotros acá, aprendiendo mucho y compartiendo también los conocimientos. Obrigado a todos amigos do Brasil por estarem aqui novamente é, prestigiando o nosso convidado e aprendendo bastante. Espero que tenha sido muito proveitoso para todos vocês. Bom, obrigado. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.